from the presentations earlier about tax credit scholarships in other states or from the poll numbers, um, what are your general thoughts on school choice in Missouri and the likelihood of some sort of school choice program passing in the near or distant future? So we'll go ahead and start here uh, with, with the speaker and then work our way down. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. I will uh, just start off by saying, so you know where I'm coming from, I, I am a proponent of school choice. I have carried legislation throughout my eight years in the House of, of varying degrees. I've supported others as well. I did a, a quick retrospective of, of uh, bills that were filed over the last 10 years going back to 2003, and there have been about 13 different proposals filed. I, I believe we may have just looked at the House side on this, dealing with various uh, tools to provide parents and children uh, some sort of, of choice program. Uh, Predominantly, I would say these did revolve around tax credit scholarship programs, very similar to what we've been discussing this morning. Many of the same characteristics uh, were, were patterned after these bills. The bills took all sorts of different uh, characteristics as far as who could be eligible for them. Some bills were more broad and would apply to anybody anywhere in the state. Uh, others, as, as, uh, as critiques came up, as, uh, as battle lines were drawn in certain legislation, they were more narrowly tailored to only be available to students in unaccredited districts. And there was one bill that a colleague of mine carried for about seven or eight years. It was called Bryce's Law. It dealt with the special needs, uh, special needs children. And that type of tax credit scholarship, I believe, was talked about this morning as well. Uh, Bryce's Law suffered the fate of all the other legislation I've referenced. None of those bills passed except for last year when Bryce's Law did actually pass and go into law, and it, it, it enjoyed a huge bipartisan vote of 152 to 4 in the House. It was placed onto a Senate bill, and so it, it, it became law, and the governor signed it. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting distinction that the bill underwent, and I'm not really sure why people were more willing to support this than the traditional tax credit scholarship, but what, what Representative Scharnhorst did was, uh, originally Bryce's Law was a pretty standard tax credit scholarship program for special needs children, mainly in the autism spectrum disorder, like what we've heard this morning. And it operated in that function where people would donate private dollars to uh, scholarship organizations and then they would set up the parameters for how those would be given out. That was modified last year to require the state education department to seek financial resources in the form of grants and donations to be devoted to scholarship funds or clinical trials for children with special needs or autism. So the tax credit component was removed and a grant slash donation component was added. Uh, it's interesting, I don't know that it's a distinction with much of a difference, but for whatever reason, sometimes when you change semantics, legislators become more comfortable with bills. So <laughs> suddenly that bill had huge bipartisan approval. It's the only bill I could find to date truly under this subject that has become law. So perhaps that does give us a little bit of, of hope uh, for the future. Uh, in general, the, um, the issue of school choice in Missouri has been less of a uh, partisan one and more of a geographic one. Uh, and, and with a little, always a little bit of partisanship in there, of course, but it's been more of a geographic one. Uh, trying to convince more of our rural legislators whose schools generally do not uh, suffer the same challenges as some of the schools in the more suburban and urban areas to become comfortable with this type of private uh, funding mechanism uh, in the school choice arena. So that's probably a nutshell analysis and my colleagues will probably delve deeper. Thank you. <clears throat> I will tell you that for many years when I served in the House, I was always an opponent of um, uh, tax credits for scholarships. And I was the bookend for years and years. And um, any time any of these proposals would come up, I would do my due diligence and just completely work against it. But I'm here to tell you today that I do support cho choice the way, um, depending on the way it's defined. And I have actually moved in my journey when it comes to offering students options. And the reason why I have evolved to the point where I am right now is one, I was a transfer student. 
I was a student that had a parent who decided to move to the city of St. Louis just so I could get a great education in St. Louis County. And I did at Clayton School District. And when folks, as we've been discussing the student transfer policy, they've been associating the transfer program as choice. It's not choice. It's not the way people define it as choice like tax scholarships. Um, it's a different type of decision that parents um, have so that their children can have an option. I'm in a different place today because of the Normandy School District, which I represent, and the Riverview School District, which I represent. Both districts are unaccredited. And what we have seen by the behavior of the families is that they want to stay close to home. Many have transferred to other districts, surrounding okay. districts, which I completely and utterly support because I was a transfer student. And I know the quality that can be provided to students in neighboring school districts and other school districts. But I also found out, I am also a school board member, um, that many of the children who have decided to transfer are going back home, knowing that the school district they're going back to is unaccredited. At least about 40% of our students are going back. And so I had to rethink, where am I going to be when it comes to education policy for our children? My obligation is to those children who live within the boundaries of Normandy and Riverview. And if they are deciding to stay within the boundaries of those districts, if they're deciding to stay in buildings that are fully unaccredited, then I believe that they should have choices within that district. Now that's how I define my, my belief in choice. It's different than what it's looked like before. We passed policy a couple of years ago saying that charter schools can be expanded into unaccredited schools. That passed. Um, was the bill perfect? No, it wasn't. Am I trying to take that away? No, I'm not. I also believe that if there are uh, private options, non-religious private options within the boundaries of those unaccredited districts, children should be able to go to those schools. The behavior of the children in my unaccredited districts is that they want to be close to home. Well, I don't want them to be stuck in one building that's unaccredited. I don't want that for them. I'm not saying that the private school is going to be great. I'm not saying that the charter school is going to be great. And I'm certainly not saying that the traditional public school is going to be great either. But I do believe that there should be choice within that community. There should be choice for those children. As we are trying to, um, and my philosophy has always been to rebuild preserve and sustain, to rebuild districts that have failed our children, to preserve districts that are right on the cusp of being fully accredited, and to sustain those school districts that are fully accredited. And the issue that we are all dealing with this year is very complicated. The way that I explain it is that we're playing seven tiers of chess simultaneously. You gotta watch every single move. or. It's it's equivalent to me, at least, um, trying to decode our tax code. It's very difficult, very complex. So I am a supporter of choice, depending on how it's defined. I want my children who live within these boundaries to have choice. They want to stay in Normandy. Not, I'm not going to change their behavior. The speaker is not going to change their behavior, Senator Lamping. No one in the legislature, no one in this world can change the behavior of these families. If they're deciding to go back home, give them options until, until we get to the point where we can rebuild those districts that have failed them. And so that's kind of where I am. I've evolved. Um, I'm on a different journey. Um, as I, I say that I was the bookend, and I was the bookend. I'm no longer the bookend because I have to address the concerns of my students. I'm not falling off the cliff, um, but I do want to give as many opportunities as possible within the boundaries of unaccredited districts for the students um, that just so happen to live in the wrong zip code. Um, 
Well, before I started, I would just say that uh, the Senate really benefits uh, Senator Chappelle Nadal's experience on the University City School Board. I, and the Senate is 34, and of those 34, there's no doubt that uh, Senator Chappelle Nadal has the greatest understanding of the inner workings of a district and how it interacts with its school board. So she's been a tremendous resource. Uh, I very much appreciate um, the polling information and the, the professional nature of the poll. Um, it's a little depressing, though, uh, in that uh, the poll is so obviously, you know, it's so, it's so overwhelmingly in support of choice when the political realities are so uh, very much different than that. Uh, Missouri has a very strong filibuster. We have 34 senators, and two or three or four senators can stop just about anything. But I'm not here to tell you that two or three senators are opposed to choice. I'm here to tell you that the uh, institutional education in the state of Missouri is the single strongest lobby that is in the capital, bar none. Um, and a lot of it can be understood through what we learned through the poll. So um, when you look at the overall satisfaction levels of schools, we see that the level of dissatisfaction is highest in urban, suburban areas, and the overall state numbers are slightly, um, you know, they're, they're somewhat better, which means that in the rural areas that the satisfaction level of public schools in rural areas are higher. But I would disagree a little bit from the speaker in terms of it's not a rural, it's not a, a rural suburban thing so much as if you think about the Democratic Party pretty much controls the urban and suburban areas. And with the exception of very few ur urban and suburban Democrats, they are very much in lockstep with the educational establishment. So you kind of have the Democratic side of the aisle, there's, uh, there's, they'll fight any possibility of any change. And then the rural Republicans are very much in the same camp. So their, uh, their relationship with the educational establishment is just as strong. And so I would suggest that um, of the 34 that make up the state Senate, it's in the 20s that would stop anything that has to do with change. Now, having said that, we have kind of two canary in the coal mines with three weeks to go. Um, this, we're trying, there's two bills that really, it'll be interesting to see their outcomes. I think they'll suggest a lot um, to the extent that this lobby is as strong as it is. The attempts we've made to try to, re, uh, to deal with the transfer situation, included in those attempts is the, uh, the offering of a voucher uh, to attend a non-religious private school that physically exists in the unaccredited district using the only the dollars that come from the local support. So in the case of Riverview and Normandy, it's around $7,000 that would be made available. This bill passed the Senate overwhelmingly. I think it's in the House and will pass in the House. But it has not become law yet. Keep in mind that there's, to the best of our knowledge, there is not a non-religious private school that exists in the school district and in these unaccredited footprints. To the, if you see that bill, if you see that idea become law, well, then I've misspoke. Then, then there's been a little bit of a give uh, from the establishment's perspective. But um, it'll be interesting to see. I think that uh, all attempts will be made to either kill the entire transfer bill or to most certainly remove that portion of the transfer bill. Keep in mind, I think I, my feelings on the, on the transfer situation, the establishment is quite comfortable with nothing happening. They can't say it publicly, but they're very comfortable with nothing happening. They'll, they will, uh, Normandy will be bankrupt, bankrupt by July. They'll lapse the district. They'll merge it into surrounding districts. Ruby Gardens will go bankrupt next year. They'll do the same thing. And two or three years from now, the neighboring districts will probably go through the same process of unaccreditation and becoming bankrupt. The establishment is fine with that. They will not give any reform in exchange for fixing the system. So that's, that's the one canary in the coal mine. The second thing has to do with Common Core. So uh, as many of you are very much aware, I know the Shomi Institute is opposed to Common Core, as am I. Uh, the, 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 um, the piece of legislation that's before that cleared the House, Representative Barr is here, he's a sponsor in the House, overwhelmingly cleared in the, in the House, will come to the Senate floor in the next week or so. Uh, does nothing to stop Common Core from happening in these next two or three years. It just uh, mandates that Missouri start a process whereby by the end of October 15, Missouri adopts their own standards, whatever they may be. They may be 100% Common Core, then be 0% Common Core. So it's, it's a compromise um, beyond compromise. But it has not been passed in the law yet. So it would be curious to see. The establishment in my time there, and I think the speaker can speak to the same, he's been a, a consistent education reformer, is that nothing's allowed to be reformed. Nothing. There's no ground given. Um, and, uh, and that lobby is, like I said, that lobby is bipartisan, the single strongest lobby in the Capitol. So we're done. Um, Three weeks from yesterday is our last day at six o'clock, 
and it'll be curious to see what has happened to these two pieces of legislation, um, and we'll see. Hopefully we've made some, some gains, but, but we'll see. Thank you so much for those comments. We'll go ahead and open up to questions now. My wife taught second grade two miles up Florissant Road from the Normandy School District, and they take all comers at that school. I called the lady who's in charge, the assistant superintendent of instruction for the archdiocese, when they were claiming that they wanted some scholarship money, and I said, you don't take all the kids. And she said, yeah, you're right, we don't take all the kids. Same thing went with Kip. When Kip came here, I talked to Kip, and I said, hey, just take over my wife's school. They said, oh, no, 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 we don't want all the kids. Um, same thing is true right now. Those kids in the inner city, they go to charter schools. The charter schools have 40% less uh, disabled students. They have a fraction of the homeless kids. So the question I have for you is why should any of my wife's tax money go to schools that do not take all the kids, especially the kids that are really the problem kids. And I can sit here the rest of the afternoon. I described one earlier, but that's the question. Why should we spend tax money on any school that doesn't take all the kids? Well, I, I would love, and Carl, you've been at just as many forums as, as I have. And here's what I would tell you as a school board member coming from University City. Why should half of all of our children who live in University City and go to private schools, why do their parents have to pay taxes into the public school? That would be my counter question to you, number one. Number two, there are policies that are put in place, not at all charter schools, but many of the charter schools that I have gone to that absolutely do have special needs children because I've seen them for myself and they do extraordinary jobs. I'm not saying every one, but I've seen it. I have seen it for myself. Well, I know what I've seen, Carl. And I spend, I spend nine, time, nine hours a week in classrooms in both, both public and private schools. Every single week. Religious schools, traditional private schools, and our public schools throughout my district and in St. Louis City. That is what my dedication is in my personal time on top of being on the school board. So my counter question is um, that, and the other statement that I would make is that in the language that we have right now before us, Senate Bill 493 et al., there were concerns from House members, in fact, of ensuring that children who are lowest performing have the opportunity to go into these private non-sectarian schools as well as the charter schools. We put that language in because that was a concern from the House. And I wanted to make sure that, one, the children who most needed the help to achieve got that help. Because what we have seen in this New Age transfer program is that some of these receiving school districts, they're cherry picking. Why are they cherry picking the best and the brightest when the students who need the most help are the ones who do need the options going to um, either a neighboring school district or to a charter school? Um, and just one correction, we do have one non-private sec, non private non-sectarian school in the River Re Riverview School District that I didn't know about. Um, Representative Pearson corrected me on that. Um, and we want to give these children an opportunity. Here's the other thing that you have to think about. This is all about calculus. And if you're not willing to look at the calculus of this entire bill that we're looking at, we're spending $20,000 to send a student to Clayton. Some folks who've never lived within the boundaries of Normandy or Riverview are committing educational larceny and pretending that they came from these poverty-stricken areas and using Normandy and Riverview money to go to other school districts. Is that right? No. I don't think it is at all. If we are trying to ensure that Normandy and Riverview do not lapse, we have to reduce the amount of money that goes out of the district. So my constituents 
When I posed to them the question, would you like $20,000 to leave Normandy or would you like $7,000 to move out of Normandy? It's your choice. You want 20 or you want 70. Now, if you get $20,000 going out per pupil, you're not going to have a district anymore. They want a district. If you want $7,000 to go out rather than 20, you still keep a district. So the way that that happens is that you give them other options. And if you can give them, our Constitution does not bar local money, local taxpayer dollars from going to a private non-sectarian school. It says nothing. Now, Blaine Amendment in another area in our Constitution says you cannot spend state money going to a private institution or a religious school. We know that. And so, yeah, as the bookend, as the former establishment person, who I still kind of think I am, but I've moved, I've progressed, I'm in the middle now, you know, I'm saying that my children deserve to have opportunities. They deserve those opportunities. And I will ask the question to you again. In a community like University City, where half of all of our children go to private schools, why do their parents have to pay taxes into the public school district? It's the same question. The, the other thing I would simply add is this argument that private schools and charter schools don't allow for children with learning differences, IEPs, I would suggest that, that first of all, there's um, begrudging support for charter schools. So there aren't as many charter schools as there otherwise would be if they were more fully uh, embraced by the establishment. And secondly, there's no financial support for private schools. So. Um, if, and my point is, is that if there were, if we had a, uh, a, a ten year period of time where there were opportunities uh, for private school operators to get some financial support, then you may very well see a complete expansion of their offerings. So the argument that a child with an IEP or disability will not be accepted in an existing private school that physically exists in um, an unaccredited district or an impoverished area well, in the here and the now, that may be the case, but just think forward, if we've got 10 or 15 or 20 years where there's a private school funding option, um, it's only logical that you would have uh, different types of private schools emerge that would more fully address uh, the, the needs of, of children with learning differences. Yeah, I would completely agree with the Senator because, and, and Carl and you and I also love to talk but love to disagree on everything, uh, I would say the reason the reason there's not more opportunities for those children is because there's not more choice. It's sort of a circular uh, negative reasoning. If we, we don't have true choice in this state. We have extremely constricted, limited choice. Uh, charters are extremely limited. Tax credit scholarships do not exist. There really are no choice options. If the choice options, if we let freedom reign and let more options and opportunity into the system, then there will be options for those children, the, the, the most disadvantaged, the ones who have the most special needs, because there'll be a marketplace for that. There is currently no marketplace for it. My second point is, what's the alternative? Doing more of the same for 40 more years? Uh, that's what we've been doing for the past 30 to 40, and we have more and more unaccredited and challenged districts, not less and less. And money's not the answer, because over the last 35, 40 years, we have exponentially increased funding to public education nationwide and in our state. The bar graph goes like this. Student performance has flatlined or decreased. So money, you have to have it to keep your schools funded and your teachers paid, but it's not the only answer because we've tried that. We have to look at substantive, concrete reforms to the system. And, and my third, my, I'll make a third point. This will not be the end of public education as we know it. How do we know that? Because many, many, many states have incorporated many of these things we've talked about. And they have vibrant public education school systems, private education systems, charters. Some even have vouchers. And they still have public schools. So I think it's just time to try something new and give people a choice. Well, I, I have to apologize. Um, we got a late start, and so we have very little time for questions right now. But we do have a reception immediately following. Um, we'll be uh, in Harmon 249. So 
I'm going to take the prerogative of the final question and then dismiss us to go to Harmon 249 where we can mingle and ask uh, a few more questions. Because you have mentioned uh, a bill that's, that's passed through the Senate. It is now in the House. Uh, Senator Chappelle Nadal, you correctly stated that there's at least one private school in your area. We have uh, people from the private, one of those private schools uh, here in the, in the corner. Um, in the House bill, it's my understanding that they've expanded the geographic region rather than just within the district to uh, the same or adjoining county. Do you see, uh, Speaker, do you see that getting passed? And uh, do you see that the private school option, whether it's restricted to the district or expanded to the same or adjoining county, staying in the bill? Do you think, how likely is it that something gets out of the legislature this year? Well, I, uh, I think we have to pass something because it's, uh, it's at a, it truly is a crisis that needs to be solved. Something needs to be done to advance the ball down the field, and we can always go back and, and work on it in future years, but we can't just ignore this problem. So I, I, I hope we pass something. I hope the private option remains in there to some extent. I think the House simply wanted to have a, a comfortable position on the item. We, we are open to compromise, and I would say that all parties have been brought in this discussion and have worked on this bill for about four months straight now. And the senator here has put an extraordinary amount of time and effort in. I want to applaud her for her efforts and for her willingness to be uh, so open-minded and, and so conducive to the discussion. So, you know, if I was going to rate it, I, you know, hopefully 60 to 70 percent chance right now. I wish I could say higher, but as I told you from my timeline, we don't have a good track record on this. I hope we turn the corner this year. Yeah. And I, it one, I want to thank you too, Mr. Speaker, because um, early on, and, and Senator Lamping, who has been so supportive to me, as well as Represent or Senator Emery, who have both been my backbone and my support in this all along and understanding this. Um, and we, we started trying to go through this last summer there are nine or ten of us um, from the St. Louis region, from the Senate side, um, trying to just delve through what we agree to and then what we don't agree to. Um, in my bill, I knew that in order to get something for my district, I needed to give. There is not going to be a bill without the private option. I know that. Ray Charles would know that. <laughs> there is not going to be a bill without the private option. And many of my colleagues who I have voted 150% with for my entire tenure, um, they are completely and utterly opposed to the local private option. Now, I will say my difference is um, it need, I believe that the opportunity should be restricted within the boundaries. Um, that is a difference we're working out, but the bottom line is what we all agree to is there should be a local private option. We agree to that. It, 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 it won't get through the Senate unless it's restricted to the footprint. And, um, and again, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I think this will be a really important test because, again, there is an option to do nothing. None of us at this table support doing nothing. No elected official publicly supports doing nothing but I think that the establishment is fine doing nothing. So um, it'll be an interesting three weeks. I think the House position on the scholarship is not po possible in the Senate. I'm, um, I'm, I'm concerned about if the, if the Senate position is even possible in the Senate when it comes down to the very end. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we'll see. But we're hopeful. I'm hopeful. Yes. <laughs> well, I want to thank all three of you for participating. I know many of you have more questions. You want to talk. You want to discuss. I'm going to ask you to not do it here. So uh, there's a, apparently someone, uh, another class coming in right after this. So please move to Harmon Hall 249, and uh, love to talk with you more there.